Okay, so this is kind of where we left off. So as we read earlier in the chapter, early Christians were granted the right to worship legally by the Roman Emperor Constantine. So Constantine was kind of the first emperor that really embraced Christianity. I believe he was baptized um, shortly before his death. So he took Christianity pretty seriously. And after they were granted the right to worship legally, they needed churches. But the early Christians didn't really know what their churches should look like. And they decided to model their churches off of the Roman Basilica. And this is partially because it's really a, an ideal space for a large congregation of people. And that really suits itself for worship. And Constantine actually builds an enormous church over the site of St. Peter's tomb. It's called St. Peter's Church, and it's based off of a Roman basilica. And that would have taken, that would have been built in what is today the Vatican City in Rome. And that was done in the fourth century, but there are no fourth century churches that survive into the present day in their original form, unfortunately. But there are fifth century churches that we can look at that are very similar to the fourth century churches. And so we'll take a look at a couple of fifth century churches, and this is one of them, the interior of Santa Sabina, looking northeast, Rome, Italy. The year is 422 through 432. And you can see that this was built, you know, this was actually built a century after the old St. Peter's Church that was built by Constantine in what is today now the Vatican City. But even though the old St. Peter's Church does not survive, we can look at this church and it gives us a good idea of what St. Peter's Church might have looked like. Uh, this church, Santa Sabina, the west doors are made out of cypress. That's a wood, um, really beautiful carving. You can see a detail here from the west door. Sorry, this is a little bit messed up, but this is actually the crucifixion of Jesus here. He's got two of his uh, disciples here with him or two, two other men were basically crucified at the same time that he was. Um, and also down the, in the interior there as actually, this is a timber roof. So that that's really um, some beautiful details there that this church has. And you can see there are Corinthian columns that repeat all the way down um, the center. And, you know, they repeat down the nave to the apse at the end. And this helps to emphasize the apse, which frames the altar. And this is a really important area, obviously. This is where the, you know, delivering of God's word would happen. And there are clear story windows up here that emit light. And they help to, in, you know, illuminate the frescoes and the mosaics that decorate the nave and the apse. So that's pretty typical of these early... Christian churches. And the exterior is very typical as well. Uh, plain brick walls. This is similar to the Roman Basilica as well. And that's that's typical of early Christian churches to just have the plain, plain brick on the exterior of the building. So moving on, we'll look at um, a different church, some of the mosaics inside of it um, from Santa Maria Maggiore. And it's another church from the 5th century. And it's basically one of the first major churches dedicated to Mary, the mother of Jesus. Construction began in 432. And this is a church based off of the Roman Basilica, much like the others that we, have, well, the other one that we have looked at. Um, and the mosaics inside, they depict various scenes from the Old and New Testament. And they're very beautiful. They provide a lot of decoration but they also helped provide visual stories for people in attendance that could not read. Um, most people at this time were illiterate, so these mosaics provided vehicles for instructing the congregation on different important biblical events and Christian themes. So originally these mosaics were used, um, you know, originally, let's just talk about mosaics in general here. Originally they were used for just a, dur a durable flooring, and then they were, you know, they were made from small beach pebbles, but typically in just a couple colors, like black and white, 
but eventually they started arranging them in decorative patterns, which is called a pebble mosaic. And then, you know, eventually artists started arranging the stones in more complex designs, and they started using different colors besides just black and white. And by the fourth century BCE, the technique developed a high level of sophistication. And, you know, by the fourth century BCE, they actually were depicting rather elaborate figural scenes. And they started using red, yellow, brown, gray, and black and white. And they would often add shading to the figures and they would suggest volume. Um, they would use strips of lead in between the pieces of stone to kind of add linear de definition. And they would even put in backgrounds to suggest a setting. So they started to get more and more sophisticated as time goes on. And by the third century BCE, artists begin to use tesserae, which are cut stones. And that allows for even more detailed designs. And it allowed for more subtle gradations of color. And some of these mosaicists were able to really get to the level of painters with the amount of detail that they were able to achieve with tesserae during the third century BCE. So that's kind of, you know, where we're at right now is that they can get to a pretty high level of detail in these mosaics. Um, so we'll take a look at one from um, Santa Maria Maggiore from Rome, Italy, and it's the Annunciation and Adoration of the Magi. So that's this piece here. And as you can see in the top register, it shows Mary. She's surrounded by angels and then Gabriel, the angel Gabriel and the dove of the Holy Spirit are coming down to deliver the news that she will deliver um, the son of God, Jesus. So she's re receiving that news. Um, and then the register below it, we can see both Jesus here and Mary are sitting on thrones. Jesus is definitely the center of attention here. Everybody's looking at him. Um, you know, he's got this golden halo and, you know, they're receiving gifts from the Magi. And so that's kind of the second register there. And this is um, mosaics that are located in the left spandrel of the cancel, chancel arch of the Santa Maria uh, Maggiore Church in Rome, Italy. And there's some there's another one that we're going to take a look at from the Santa Maria Maggiore in Rome. Um, just checking to see what time it is. And it's called the Parting of Abraham and Lot. And this is the mosaic in the nave of Santa Maria Maggiore. And um, it shows some Old Testament stories. This one is Abraham and Lot, which is an Old Testament story that comes from the book of Genesis which is the Bible's opening book. And it's basically this, the story of Lot who leads his people to the city of Sodom. And Abraham leads his to Canaan, the city of Canaan. It's definitely the righteous choice. Um, there's actually a basilica type building back here, which symbolizes a church. And Lot's is the evil choice. He's got two of his daughters in front of him, which are basically the kind of embodiment of evil in this scene, although it's hard to tell. Um, and then this figure down here in front of Abraham is Isaac, and he's the unborn Isaac. I'm not quite sure how he looks unborn. He doesn't look unborn to me, but... And he's actually believed to symbolize good. He symbolizes, you know, good things, and he's believed to be the precursor to Jesus as well. Isaac is. So um, the mosaicist is using a technique called head cluster. So showing a lot of heads, but not a lot of bodies to signify that there's a crowd there. And the eyes and hands, as you can see in this piece, are very animated. And the hands are kind of larger than you'd think they would be, but they show up really well at that size. Um, and the eyes are, are kind of turned in their heads and they're looking at each other. Um, and so, you know, we can see this simplified motion is characteristic of late antique narratives. And it's a simple way of showing what's going on in this story. And like I said before, these mosaics are for the illiterate masses, and their main purpose is to communicate these stories from the Bible. So it makes sense that the classical representations of movement 
um, and figure representation is being abandoned Oops. for something a little more um, simple and understandable. And you can see the figures are not totally classical in style, but they do retain some classical elements, such as the shadows and the shading. Um, but later on in the history of Christian art, these mosaics will become um, a lot more simplified and flat, and the classical ideals will be abandoned completely for a much more simple style. But with these mosaics that we're looking at here, there's still uh, um, the Roman and Greek influence, the classical influence that we can see. Um, but we are beginning to see a stylistic and visual change that reflects the Christian aesthetic, which is a little bit more um, simple and not as concerned with naturalistic proportions. Um, so in 329, we'll actually talk about Rome a little bit and what ends up happening with some of the power. Um, so in 324, Constantine begins building a new Rome in the east, which he names Constantinople. And after this, the Christianization of the Roman Empire begins to spread a lot more quickly. And in 380, the emperor Theodosius is, issues a law establishing Christianity as the official state religion. And he actually in, acts a ban against the worship of the old Roman gods. And in 394, he abolishes the Olympic Games, which were the enduring symbol of the classical world and its values. So the old Rome is kind of disappearing and the Christian Rome is starting to take over. Um, Theodosius dies in 395 and his power is passed on to his two sons, Arcadius, who became emperor in the East. And then his other son, Honorius, who became empress in, emperor in the West. Um, so they had two emperors after uh, Theodosius. Um, and then after that, the Visigoths actually threatened to overrun Italy from the northwest of Italy, um, that border there. And in response to that, Honorius moves his capital from Milan to Riviena, um, which is an ancient Roman city south of Venice. In 410, the Visigoths actually come to Rome and sack Rome. And in 476, Riviena fell, falls to a Germanic king of Italy, uh, Odacier. And then he was overthrown in turn by uh, Theodoric, who is the king of the Ostrogoths. And Theodoric establishes his capital at Riviena again in 493. But then eventually Riviena falls to the Byzantine Emperor Justinian in 539. So all of these things are happening in Rome. There's a lot of overthrowing of different powers happening. Um, so just important to kind of frame what's going on with Rome at this period in, in time. Um, let me see where I'm at. Okay, we have a little bit of of time left, not a lot. So we'll take a lot a look at the mausoleum of Gala Placidia in Ravenna, Italy, 425. Um, this was actually named after Honorius's half sister. It wasn't actually originally built for her though. We don't actually know the name of the wealthy person that's buried inside. So as you as you might remember, mausoleums are typically tombs. Um, and this mausoleum or, or tomb is a small cruciform or cross-shaped structure that features a barrel vaulted um, arms and a tower at the crossing of these two um, arms. So there's a, a tower in the middle where they cross. And it was built shortly after 425. And originally this mausoleum joined the porch of the Holy Cross Church, and which was also a cruciform planned building, which means it has a cross, um, two arms that cross each other. And this particular building's arms are of unequal length. So the structure has a longitudinal orientation, but because all four arms are very short, 
the emphasis of this building is actually on the top.